Imagine you passed away, what would people know you as? As someone who has a really profound fascination with India. For me, it was like pure escapism. Assalamu alaikum viewers and listeners. Today we have a rather interesting guest. What's your greatest fear? Oh God. My greatest fear is that my mental health will get as bad as it was when I was in my 20s. Her name is Lali, who is an international traveler and a food vlogger. Do you think you got special treatments because you were white? You get ripped off a lot if you're white. People try to scam you. Yeah. I've had people record me and take pictures of me secretly as well. I was accused of racism at work. They were Indian. I felt like she had an issue with my YouTube channel. And I said, um, I don't understand why no one else wanted these. Oh, but yeah, but because you're Indian, you're Let me remind you to kindly, kindly, kindly subscribe on the platform you're tuned into. Yeah. Lali, mm -hmm. what does that mean? So Lali is, so in Hindi, it kind of means reddish color because Lal is red in Hindi. Oh. And then uh, in some villages in India, it's also considered like a kind of, um, like a pet name for like a daughter or um, like a nickname for young girls i guess and uh lali oh it also means lipstick as well <laughs> apparently um but it all stems from the fact that when i st like when i first started traveling india um my name my real name laura doesn't really translate very well because in especially in north parts of india it actually translates as um it sounds like the word lorda which means penis <laughs> Oh my god. So and my surname is Payne as well. So if I go up to people and say Oh yeah, oh, no, hi, I'm Laura Payne, they think <laughs> I'm saying, Oh hi, I'm penis Payne. So um yeah, so that was <laughs> there's like a few viral vid videos on the internet of like people interviewing foreigners in India and they'll say, Oh hi, I'm Laura and then everyone just laughs. Oh my god. So so I had to very early on I actually hadn't, I think I'd traveled to India once. And then afterwards I was, when I started learning Hindi, I was looking into the name Laura, how common is it in India? And there was lots of forums and lots of videos saying, just if you, this is your name, just change it when you go to India. <laughs> wow, that, that, that's crazy. And yeah. now that's, that has become your effectively brand name. My brand, yeah, yeah. London Kilali. London Kilali. Yeah. <clears throat> so give us a context as to how life was like growing up as a child. Oh, wow, that's deep. Um, life growing up. Okay, so I actually grew up in Devon uh, in a town called Columpton. And when I was nine, my dad uh, wanted to pursue his business uh, in Cambridge. And so we moved to a village called Gambling Gay between Bedford and Cambridge. Um, so that was quite a big deal, I guess, changing schools at such a young age. Um, I was I was really shy, like super shy, probably up until the age of about 16, 17, like really shy, like so shy that even like when relatives come and stay, I would like hide upstairs. <laughs> no way. Where do you think that shyness came from? I don't know. I just I just really lacked confidence, like massively in all my school reports. It said like, we know that Laura's really intelligent, but she just lacks confidence. She never puts her hand up. She's just too shy and all this kind of thing. Every single report said lacks confidence, lacks confidence. Do you think it could, it could be certain um, experiences you've had maybe when you were really, really young? Because I think uh, for me as well, confidence was, was, it still is a big problem. So for example, we're going to do this interview and I'm going to let you go and then I'm going to do the, int um, the introduction afterwards. Yeah. For me, confidence is, is something that I'm, I'm constantly battling with, fighting with. Mm. Uh, and I think when I trace back into my memory, I think it's probably maybe what certain people have said, certain, certain things to me that has registered in my mind where it made me feel like, yeah, I'm nothing, I'm nobody, you know, I can never achieve anything in, in my life. Um, do you think you've had any, any similar situations or, or is it just one of the, it's just a coincidence? I think it's just a coincidence, but I just do, I do remember my dad always just saying to me, like, there's no such thing as confidence. You just have to pretend to be confident and then it just comes naturally. Okay. So I always had to just force myself to try and be confident because when you get to like 16, 17, 
you then have to think about your career and like what you're going to do and going to job interviews and you can't be shy in these kind of situations. So I used to have to, I used to get so nervous, but I used to just have to push through it and just pretend to be confident, I guess. But I, I don't know where it comes from. I have no idea. No Amazing. Idea. Lally, what's your greatest fear? Mm. <laughs> I have a few. Um, oh, God. I don't want to get emotional. Um, okay. I think there's like two main ones. Uh, the first one is my greatest fear is that my mental health will get as bad as it was when I was in my 20s and around the age of 30. Like it's in a really good place now, but it was in an incredibly bad place for around just over 10 years, I'd say. Uh, and my greatest fear is that I would, uh, instead of progressing, like I would go back to that stage. Like, I just hope that never happens because I, I, so. I was in a really dark place. I hope um, so. The other fear is that I won't achieve all the things that I want to achieve in my life and that my parents won't be alive to see them. Like, that's what I really worry wow. about. Wow. Um, that's a um, very different uh, type of fear from, from what we normally <laughs> hear. Um, so what's your life purpose then? You know, what is it that you want to achieve? Where, what do you want your parents to see? I would love my parents to see me get married and have children, but I've never even been in a relationship where I've thought it would, you know, get to the marriage point or anything like that. So... Yeah, I, th I think as it, since I was a kid, like, you know, when you're a little girl and you're like drawing, like I used to just always draw pictures of people getting married <laughs> <laughs> and you'd always like imagine like you'd watch Disney like films and stuff. And then when you get older, you realize it's not the reality, like this whole like falling in love and stuff and like the Disney scenario, like kind yeah. of you think, well, maybe, maybe does that not exist? I don't know. It's not existing for me. Um, but yeah, I'd love to have my dad like walk me down the aisle and see me get married. Like that would be the best thing ever. Now I'm 35 this year and I'm thinking if it happens, it's going to happen when I'm like older. And then also, <laughs> is it even, even going to happen at all? So yeah, that's, I think mm. it's like a com combination of like, I worry that that will never happen. And I'm wondering, like, why will it not happen? And then also, like, worrying that if it does happen, my parents won't be there to see it. Mm. So what, let's assume, and, and I hope it doesn't happen soon, imagine you passed away. What would people know you as? Uh, <laughs> um, they would know me as someone who has a really profound fascination with India. And hopefully as somebody who's like a talented, creative person, I hope. What is this fascination with Indian subcontinent? And when did you discover that you had this fascination? So from a young age, as a, a young kid, I was never interested in travel or anything like that. Um, but when I was 23, I was really anxious, really depressed, and I was in a really, really dark place. And I just thought, I just want to escape and go somewhere else. I don't care where it is. I just want to go somewhere that's completely different to where I'm from. And I'd never actually been in a country, a non-Western country before. And I was looking at India. So I went to India. I went to South India. I went to Tamil Nadu. I went to Kerala. And for me, it was like pure escapism. It was like I'd landed on a completely different planet and all those problems that I had, they didn't go away, but they definitely lifted. And I was, I think mindfulness is a real thing. Like if you're mindful of what's going on around you, it really does help your mental health a lot. So if you're like stimulated by everything that's happening in front of you, you're escaping, I guess. And that's where it came from. So, and actually I think the biggest uh, culture shock for me was coming home because it was weird coming home and everything's like, the roads are really straight and like everything's made of concrete and there's less, I guess, like greenery and the rural landscape is so different to South India and I don't know. And the people as well are so different. It just felt like, you know, London felt really gray and cold 
uh, compared to India, I guess. And India is so warm in its colors and its people, everything. So I just fell in love with the culture. I just loved it. Was there any <clears throat> competing countries when you were deciding where to go for your escapism? Yeah, I was looking at uh, Sri Lanka. I don't know why it didn't make the cut. Um, I was looking at Sri Lanka and I was looking at Vietnam, but I actually went to Vietnam the year after I went to India and I didn't like it because okay. I just wished it was India. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a bit weird. Um, so yeah, I just developed this addiction to India and I just kept going back and then I was learning Hindi as well. So yeah. So after your first journey, what did you learn about India? What what did you come back with? Um I learned like I guess everyone has this misconception that India is well, there is a lot of Hindus that live there, but I didn't realize that there were, you know, many other religions living side by side. There's a huge Christian uh, community in some parts of India. And in Goa, big, right? Goa especially, yeah. yeah. Um and uh, Muslim community also, although it's nowhere near as big, but um, I just liked the variety of the religions that you see there. And I know there's a lot of variety in the UK too, but I feel like it's a lot more in your face in India. Yeah. It's very much... Because it's, it's practice yeah, quite a bit, isn't it? exactly. Um, I guess I, l I learned about all different types of fruit and things that I'd never even heard of like jackfruit and stuff <laughs> like it sounds silly now because you can get jackfruit curries and things here yeah. now and it's more well known but back then like over like you're talking like 12 13 years ago or whatever I didn't know the jackfruit <laughs> so like things like that how did jackfruit taste when you first tasted it oh I didn't eat it I just saw it hanging from the trees and I was like that looks like the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in a tree so <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they were ripe back then. Oh when my I went, god! So, yeah. Interesting, interesting. Now, you know, um, you said when you came back to the UK, everything seemed very rigid, very systemized, very you know where it should be. Yeah. Um, that that is true. That how I feel like that as well. When I come back from come back from Bangladesh, there's less bumpiness on the road. It's just you're just sliding on the on the road. Um, but uh, when we do go, just because we live uh, in a certain country, we get extra, you know, attention, respect. Mm. Mm. Now, you being British, white, um, obviously, we know the history, what, ha what happened two, some 200 years ago. Um, I think people still hold some of that, some of that feeling where they want, they express certain respect to a certain um, skin color. Mm -hmm. Do you think you got special treatments, extra special treatments because you were white? Probably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't always get treated well though. You get ripped off a lot if you're white when you travel India, people try to scam you. Um, you get a lot of attention, people asking for selfies. Um, but when I went to India the first time when I was 23, people were fascinated with me because of my skin color, but I was also f equally fascinated with them. So I was just like, yeah, you want a selfie? I want a selfie with you too. Like, it was just <laughs> kind of like an equal fascination kind of thing. Um, and then I think after the first trip, I came to realize it's not really something that I like anymore it's not really I don't think that I should get special attention just because I'm white I think that's a bit I find it really weird it's just like you see white people on tv I'm sure you've seen a white person before why do you need a picture of me like it's just I find it really bizarre um so I generally say no now um it's mostly in uh the uh trail of thoughts gone uh it's mostly in the touristic areas that you get that because you get people coming in from villages yeah um that see someone white and they yeah no you're right definitely it's, it's generally the village people some of them probably don't even have tv <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> so yeah. so they they do get really fascinated um when they see someone very someone sticking out like a sore thumb but it's just like, what are you gonna do with that picture when you get home? It's just, I just, I yeah. just, it's just find it really strange. Yeah. I've had people record me and take pictures of me secretly as well. I don't like that. Um, it happened in Vietnam as well. People hiding behind trees, taking pictures of you. It's, it's really strange. Really? Yeah. 
It's really bizarre. Actually, it was worse in Vietnam because they, they're too shy to ask. So they just, uh, and a lot of Chinese tourists there as well were just, we were in a museum and they're just filming me. It's really weird. And it had it in art galleries in India as well. You're just looking in an art gallery and you're looking at the art, but you feel like you're part of an installation or something. <laughs> everyone's like looking at you and taking pictures of you. And I hate that because people pretend to take pictures of what they're looking at in the in the gallery, but then you know, they're actually taking a picture of you. And it's really intimidating, especially if you're traveling on your own as a solo female traveler. It's not nice. So. Yeah, because you don't know where that photo is going to end up. You don't know where that photo is going to end up, but it's also just really intimidating. Yeah. It's just um, it's just unwanted attention. Unwanted. No, you're right. Absolutely right. Um, so if you were to rank, obviously that you've got Pakistan, Bangladesh and India. Yeah. Have you ever done any homework around uh, those two other countries, neighboring countries? And how would you rank them if you have? How would I rank? I can't do that because I haven't traveled to Bangladesh and I haven't traveled to Pakistan. So I can't possibly rank them. Um, I mean, after all, they were all one country, mm -hmm. you know, long time back. So... I think I'm drawn to Pakistan and Bangladesh because of my interest in India. So Bangladesh, that became an interest for me because I, in my last year living in London, I was living uh, in E1 and I didn't live very far from Brick Lane. And I was just fascinated and I was living there during uh, Ramadan and I just loved the vibe in the evenings when all the Muslim community were out in the evenings and it just there was just like a buzz in the air and I got to know the guys who run Taj stores and it just they were just like the friendly faces that I saw on a regular basis and I just I don't know I just really love I just really loved it so I did a lot of research about Brick Lane and started making YouTube videos to do a Bangladesh uh Someone, someone should really sponsor you to to um, do Bangladesh tour in Bangladesh because um, there's, I'd love there's a that. lot. There's I'd a lot to be seen. I'd absolutely love that. I would love it if uh, a touring company contacted me and sponsored me. I would love it. Um, and same with Pakistan. I'm in talks with somebody at the moment who uh, is it's an adventure company in Pakistan, and we're just trying to negotiate. Um, the right fee or whatever, but I would love to go to Pakistan as well. Um, so yeah. if someone wants to sponsor you, what what is it? Travel ticket, uh, plane ticket, uh, trans accommodation? and I'd and want probably all expenses, including the flight and travel, everything whilst I'm there, accommodation. And then on top of that, you want to get paid. You Because at the end of the day, you're, you are there obviously to enjoy it because you want to show that on camera, but you're, you're also working, right? Yeah. You know, people probably look at these people who are influencers and go, oh yeah, they get to travel and they do all these amazing things. But when I'm filming at restaurants, even if I'm getting all the food for free, I'm so stressed because I'm just thinking I need to capture everything and I need to, you know, and my friends who I invite, they're the ones that get to enjoy it because <laughs> they can just relax. Whereas yeah. I'm just like, okay, I need to capture this before you eat it. And I need to like capture myself eating it. And I need to interview the chef and I need to interview the restaurant owner. And I need to capture all the surrounds outside the restaurant and inside the restaurant, everything. You're, you're working. It's work. And I, okay, so maybe... I think some influencers don't really do it properly, but I have 12 years of experience in broadcast. So I'm trying to cover myself as much as possible, get as much footage as possible. So I have so much to edit with and I spend hours on the editing as well. So I don't think it's fair to say, uh, I don't know, me asking for money as well as free accommodation I don't or, and flights. I don't think that's yeah. unreasonable. To yeah, no, you know, what? I can completely relate to that because sometimes when you get invited to even restaurants, I'm not, I'm not even an influencer, but sometimes you do get invited to come and taste some food. And yeah, you have that pressure. Instead of enjoying that food, you're thinking, you know what, I need to edit this. I need to upload it. You know, mm. how, am I, how is it going to turn out? You know, there's an expectation now on you mm. to deliver some content. So yeah, you don't end up enjoying. Yes, if you go without any responsibilities, then yes, that's when you enjoy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So and also, <coughs> if I don't like something, I'm not going to um, include it in my edit or I'm just going to say to them, look, I just actually really didn't like the food. I'm not the kind of person. I don't like being called an influencer. Uh, I'd say I'm a content creator because I've met influencers before that literally promote anything. 
and I will never be that person. Like th I've asked them, I've said to them, do, do you actually like everything that you eat? And they're just like, no, I hated this thing, but I got paid, so I had to do it. And, you know, it's just like a sellout. I don't want to be that person, you know. So you speak a bit of Hindi. Haji. Haji. I'm Hindi ball sakti hoon. What else? What else? Give us some more. Aap you put me on the aap kaise ho? <laughs> Main bahut badhiya hu. Aur aap? Aur aap? Aur aap? Um sab kuch tik tak. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's more Pakistani I think. Yeah, sab possibly. Kuch tik -tak hai. Yeah, this is why I really want to go to Pakistan also is because mm. they speak Urdu and Urdu is like 90% Hindi so I think I think I would be okay there. I know one. I know one. Go um, on. So when I used to work in uh, market stalls hmm. um, back in 2010, and my neighbouring stalls were Gujarati people mm -hmm. and Sikh people. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if they're Gujarati. Or, I mean, I don't know. Anyway, they, they had turbans on and then they were Sikh. And I asked them, like, how do I say in your language, you know, very good perfumes and come and try. Um, so the guy told me, Barya, Barya, perfume. Hey, <laughs> dek <lije." laughs> <laughs> wow. But yeah, but yeah, but yeah. Is that why you laughed when I said but yeah? Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, perfume. Hey, dek lije. <laughs> what does Hanji mean? Haji, uh, so ha means yes, and then Haji, G is basically respectful. So in North India, especially, um, they would say G, like in Rajasthan, places like that. They say, so sometimes they, you might get asked a question and you to say yes, you might just say G or Haji. Oh. Uh, so yeah, or or you to re be respectful, like I would call you like Kazi G. Kazi G. Kazi G. Yeah. That's something that you don't have in English, do you? No. This, this element of respect. No, it's not there, which is sad. Yeah. <laughs> so th th these these languages are very rich. They've got a thing, a, an expression for pretty much everything and yeah. every feeling. So. No, that's one thing I found quite um, interesting when I moved to this country um, mm. in 1997 at the age of 11. Now, imagine someone hasn't been to India. I haven't been to India yet, although I'm a Bangladeshi. And my my border where I live, um, the other side is Karim Ganj. Mm -hmm. It's the Indian part, although they speak Bengali in the other side. Mm -hmm. But there's a river that splits us. Mm -hmm. I think it's the Shurma River or something. And our village or our, our place... Bara, whatever you want to call it, is neighboring to India. And, okay. and um, so how would you describe to someone who hasn't been to India, how would you tell them what it's like? What's that feeling like, you know, boarding a plane? And then um, what do you get to see? Because I feel like, you know, if you're traveling to a certain country, you start experiencing that journey or that culture from the moment you get to the airport. Uh, particularly in Bangladesh. I mean, if you're traveling to Bangladesh, you go to British uh, Bangladeshi High Commission uh, in in London. You'll you'll get a piece of Bangladesh there. Uh, <laughs> what was what's like? What's what's it like um, about India? Close your eyes and t tell us. I mean, it's it's hot. It's chaos. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's absolute chaos, but it's like controlled chaos. Like it's 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 madness from the outside. But from the inside, it, it it does make sense. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what I'm talking about, really. So but I, when, you, when, you, when you boarded the plane, what was the experience? Did you like the food? Are you Did talking you like about like the first time I went yeah, there? Or yeah, you took, yeah, okay. Yeah. I don't, I, it was just fundamentally the people more than anything. Yeah. It was just the people, the warmth that you get from people. That's That was just the most profound thing. I think the first time I went there, I probably really struggled with the food, to be honest with you. Because if you're not used to that kind of food and you've never been to a country outside of, or outside of Western, outside of Europe or whatever, it's you really struggle to keep that food down. So for me, it wasn't the food first time I went. It was definitely the people. The people were what got me hooked, like massively hooked and just kept going back. The connections that I've made in India, uh, I have strong connections in the UK, but I feel like Indians are very loyal. I think the connections that I have, the true friendships that I have, the really true friendships that I have are friends for life. Um, and that's what I really value, I guess. And yeah, friendships in India are like, People who have close friends, they consider them their brothers or their sisters. Like, that's what I really like. And I think that's what the UK lacks a little bit is um, it's almost like embarrassing to be really, really close to friends and like express your emotions. Yeah. In India, they're 
much more expressive, I think, with their emotions. Yeah. Yeah. So. <clears throat> and community as well is tighter, obviously. How long were you down for? I mean, you said you struggled with food. Were, were you throwing up or, or you couldn't eat or what was it like? Uh, because I'm, sh- I know it's, it's it's a big adjustment from from going to from a western western country to another, what we consider third world country. Um, the food difference, the water, everything is just so different. And before, I used to just eat anything mm. from the street vendors. From, oh no, from I do water. that. I do that. I eat everything. I never used to, but I eat everything now. Wow. wow. I, I love it. You've got, you've got a good <laughs> immune system for sure. No, I, I actually prepare myself before a trip now and just start eating like really spicy stuff to get. I think I don't think it's so much. A lot of it is just the spices that just mess with your stomach, I think. For, for me, me, I think it's the water. Oh, know? I don't drink the water. The When I did drink the water, I ended up in hospital. Exactly. Yeah. That's I was the... in hospital in Delhi. And what was really bad is I was actually in India that time for work uh, because I was working for a charity called MTV Staying Alive Foundation. And we were doing a lot of work to do with educating Indians, like young Indians about sexual health, tuberculosis and nutrition. So I was employed to make digital videos for for them. So it's a company, we're based in the UK, but we were working with MTV India. And... uh, yeah, I went over there for work, but the week before I went to a friend's wedding in Delhi. The work was in Mumbai the week after, but the week before I was in Delhi. And I went to a wedding and I got the mahindi, the henna put on my hands. And I I was asking this auntie, can you get me some water? And she got me some tap water and I drank it. And yeah, the next day I was throwing up and everything was coming out my everywhere. <laughs> like it was like, I don't know if it's going to come out my ass or is it going to come out my mouth? I don't know. But I was crying because it was horrible. And I was in a hotel room like on my own. And I was on the phone to actually the groom who was getting married the next day. <laughs> and I was like, I'm really sick. And he was like, there's nothing I can do. I'm doing all these like rituals and stuff. <laughs> like, so he got his best mate to pick me up and I went to A&E and then they put me on a drip. The drip that was actually, um, the fluid was like on a coat hanger, which they hung up from like a fan. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, yeah, it was, it was just like a, a, a hospital where anyone can go. It wasn't like a, you know, fancy okay, private so you just hospital. Walk in and, you know, so you get I went treated. there, I didn't walk in. I was like on a trolley. I was, oh I was bad. I was in a bad way. So oh we went God. into this emergency room and my friend said to me, Lali, I'm going to put my coat over your head because it smells really bad in here. (laughs) I was like, oh my God. And he was like, it's everything. It's just some really bad stuff that's happened in here. Like in the emergency room, he was like, I don't want you to see it. And I don't want you to smell it. So he put a coat over my head and I was going through this room thinking, what on earth was in, what's in here? (laughs) Wow. So so water, stay away from water. Yeah. Stay away from the tap water. In Bangladesh, we have the pond water as well. Oh. <laughs> pond water, the the table well water. I've drank water from a well in <clears throat> India and that was fine. But apparently I shouldn't have done that. You know, when I when I go to Bangladesh, even for two weeks, because we're going away for two weeks, you don't want to lose any day while you're out there. Mm. And before what I used to do is just eat anything, drink anything. And then now what I do is even when I'm brushing my teeth, it's got to be bottled water. Oh, no, I don't do that. I just use the tap water and I brush yeah. my teeth. I'm too late. I'm just lazy. I just <laughs> I just think I'll spit it out. I'll be fine. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> that's crazy. I think you build up a tolerance the more you go there. Yeah. But I, yeah, I don't think, hopefully, inshallah, I don't get sick like that again. That was bad. So you're very much into the street food type of food i mean we, did you experience the high-end fine dining of india no i can't afford that <laughs> <laughs> i can't afford that um yeah actually if you want to go really high end in india that's very expensive probably yeah. even more so expensive than it is in london well or on par anyway like um yeah it's there's a lot of rich people in india look and the richest person in india is way richer than uh the richest person in the UK. So I don't agree with you when you say third world country. I don't consider it to be a third world country. Mm. Do you think India will ever be as organized as 
the West because no. I have given up hope in my country because as you know when we uh, British Bangladeshis when we go and say oh why is it not like this why are they not organizing this you know why are they not like more the West I'm like you know if India hasn't made it you know in terms of how they do them uh, do things in uh, in terms of how they organize themselves and administer themselves why is it that Bangladesh is going to be like you know West it's not going to be you know india is much bigger much more powerful much more resources and it's still chaos it's chaos but you can get something delivered to you like like that like super quick 100% and, and it's like amazing like how crazy things like um food delivery for example you could just order like one thing just like a can of coke and it would be there within like two minutes and and it's just nuts and it's just one drink and it's just like what like why would and people do that just just order one like one thing and convenience is so so good so good for sure you're absolutely right in in that sense there's someone to do everything and because the you've got the power of so many people you can make things happen very quickly um But yeah, generally, so so that's amazing. But things don't happen on time <laughs> because of things like traffic and stuff. So that's the chaos of it. It could be an attitude but, too, no? It's yeah, just oh, the, yeah, way, that's the true. way it is. That's true. It's confusing for me sometimes because I'll meet a friend and I'll be like, oh, it's okay if I'm late because, you know, IST, like, you know, it's going to Indian standard time. Everyone's, <laughs> la- everyone's late. Um and he'll actually turn up on time and be like, why are you late? And I'll just say, like, oh, because I thought everyone's late. <laughs> it's really hard to figure out what the, <laughs> what the right thing is, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean. That's I, one I, thing I never got to understand because with, um, I mean, I learned that um, the hard way because in my documentary, there's a there's a section where it says I was over an hour late. Okay, first of all, it was a setup by the producers to make me look <laughs> like that way. I was never late. I was just around the corner. Um, but anyway, I didn't know John took it very offensively when when oh, someone yeah. someone oh, yeah. didn't that turn scene up on was time. Bad man. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? That is so true because John he made so much effort to come on time. Yeah. And I couldn't, you know give that same reciprocate the same courtesy yeah to be there on time too so so i uh, since then i really changed how i how i travel to places i, w- I always worked backwards before i would work forwards yeah. you know i have to leave home and then i have to be somewhere at, at a certain time mm. now if i'm going to be at s- there at six o'clock then i have to work backwards and make sure there's enough slack mm. as well but i think it's it's within how we how we are as a, as a nation that's what made that documentary so entertaining for me was seeing you work with these older white dudes and it was just like hilarious <laughs> and i think they enjoyed it too like you could he even said to camera like he was just like i'm enjoying you every know, moment I'm, of like, it. I'm enjoying every moment of this journey <laughs> like i just thought it was brilliant amazing you know <laughs> One aspect of you, mm. there's a fascination, and I'm going to come back to it, um, the fascination of India and how you are almost like a brown person inside the I body say, of a white person. You know, like there's the coconut. I always say, am I like the lychee? Like, you know, this like <laughs> pink and white on the outside, but it's got the brown pip on the inside. <laughs> or so the inverted coconut. <laughs> an inverted coconut, yeah. Um, <clears throat> now, you've, you've done some really big jobs um, in broadcasting world. I wouldn't say um, big jobs, but... Well, big companies, interest, MTV, interesting uh, jobs. Paramount, mm. um, Nick, uh, Nickelodeon, Le- yeah, and, and Sony Pictures and Entertainment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, talk to me about what was life like in the corporate world and why did you transition from, you know... Because everyone aspires to have a corporate job, a stable, you know, yeah. job. And, you know, it kind of speaks for themselves. You know, I work in such and such place as such and such. In, in our community, mm. I'm an accountant, I'm a solicitor, I'm a doctor, I'm this, I'm that. All of that stuff matters. But you, on the other hand, you went sideways. Mm. Why? This is, uh, this is going into interesting territory. Um, Talk to us. Oh. <laughs> This is why I open up Pandora's box. Could be like a can of worms. Okay. Um, So I was very, very career driven. And I think part of that was to do with, well, 
my dad uh, is a CEO of his company and he was always so um, enthusiastic when it came to me and my brother talking about, you know, when we started being interested about, um, you know, choosing our careers and everything, he was always so supportive and really with me every step of the way. And I really, really worked so hard to try and build a career and move up the ladder. And uh, I started at Cartoon Network at Turner Broadcasting. Uh, I was really lucky because I did a media production degree and most people that do media production end up not working in media. It's so competitive. I don't know why it's so competitive. Maybe because of the glamour of like all television and film and all this kind of thing. Um, but I was really lucky and I got an interview for an internship at Cartoon Network and I got the job and that was like amazing. I had to like pinch myself and this was in the heyday of TV when we used to have so much money. Our budgets were just huge, you know, and the perks were like incredible. You got taken out for free meals all the time. You got taken out for drinks and like really fancy restaurants in Soho. And, you know, it was like, you're like living the dream, you know, you'd go to um, get your work um, audio mixed and you'd have a runner come and bring, bring you food and stuff. And, and for a 21 year old, watching people that are older than you, bringing you food that's free <laughs> from any restaurant in Soho, whilst you're working on this project, working with the voiceover, working with the sound engineer, that was like, this is really cool, you know? Um, <coughs> and it was really cool. Um, and then I worked at Sony and that was very different because back then, I guess this is before like the Me Too sort of thing, working in the corporate environment there, I had a boss who was absolutely disgusting. Like he was said really outrageous, disgusting things about women. He would say really weird sexual stuff. He would just make you feel really awkward. Um, and I didn't laugh at his jokes. Everyone laughed at his jokes and I refused to laugh at them. And because of that, he didn't give me the same opportunities as say other people. So I had a habit of really rubbing him up the wrong way because I just didn't wanna play the game. I was really bad at playing office politics. I always have been. I'm just too honest. I can't do that. I hate it. I feel like if you play office politics all the time, you're making yourself into a person that's not you. And I just don't like that. I really hate that. So I'm not going to be that sort of people pleaser. I'm not going to like, you know, be brown nosing like the boss just because I want a promotion. I just was never that person. So um, you think all of that turns into a habit, just playing... Politics. I think some people just just turn up to work and they're a different person and they just and there's a lot of office politics in these these companies. They sound really cool and glamorous, you know, Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon, Paramount, S Sony Pictures. At the end of the day, behind all the glitz and the glamour in these big corporate offices, there's a lot of office politics. And depending on how you play your cards is how your career is going to go. So it's. Yeah, it's a struggle. Um, and I always felt like I was a very creative person and I was always <coughs> like put in a box or like, you know, not able to reach my full potential. So um, after being at Sony and working with this terrible boss who was just horrible and on my last day he threatened me and he said, don't mess with people in the industry uh, because you never know who I know and I might know people at Nickelodeon. No he was like really threatening um, and in front of everyone, this was meant to be like my last day, like leaving speech kind of thing, like my boss saying something and he was just, I have some one, one, some advice for you. Don't like fuck with people in the industry. Sorry. I don't mean to swear, but that's what he said. He was like, don't fuck with people in the industry. I know people and all this kind of stuff. He didn't know people. He was just trying to intimidate me. It was just awful. Hey guys, I hope you have been enjoying today's episode of Side by Side with myself, Kazi Shafiqur Rahman and our guest, Lali. If you have been enjoying our episode today, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and comment below with any questions you may have and any guest recommendations. Let's get straight into the show. Um, so I got a job at Nickelodeon and Nickelodeon was awesome because we still had big budgets then, which was great. So I was able to like do lots of really cool shoots. So in TV, I worked in promotions. So that meant working with 
presenters or graphic designers and promoting like our biggest shows basically so you might promote new episodes of spongebob squarepants or you might promote episodes of i don't know iCarly or whatever and then you get eventually we were working with influencers like famous influencers in the kids tv world and that was really fun um but i yeah i left because <laughs> God. Was that your last job, Nickelodeon? Then my last job was Nickelodeon, but it basically, <clears throat> uh, we formed like a kind of hub, a creative hub with all the other channels. So we became Paramount um, because they joined with Paramount. Paramount's obviously the film side of things, uh, but Paramount Plus also launched out of that. And we've got MTV, Comedy Central, Channel 5, Nickelodeon, all under the same roof, all in one creative hub. And, uh, yeah, so that was Paramount, but I was mostly at Nickelodeon and I was there for nine years, but for seven of those years, I was in the same job role and I felt unchallenged. I was asking for a promotion each year. I was asking for a pay rise each year. And in, <clears throat> other than just the standard pay rise that you get, that's in line with inflation, I never got like a proper, you know, pay rise and I never got a promotion for seven years, but I have no regrets because... I was able to save money and buy my first home. So I bought a house in Bedford and yeah, that was great. The reason I left, which I think is a stroke of luck, I needed to leave. I was really frustrated uh, for not being promoted for so long, not being challenged enough. Uh, I needed to leave, but something really big needed to happen for me to leave. What was that big thing? Okay. This is the <coughs> this is the Pandora's box, okay? Go on. This is the thing that you're going to put in the trailer <laughs> that's going to that's going to entice people to watch the video. <laughs> you're a creative, you know how so, it goes. <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. Um, so an incident happened where I was accused of racism at work. So okay. racism from a inverted coconut. <laughs> Uh, what do you mean? As in like, you oh, know, Oh yeah, you, I'm the inverted coconut. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I go, oh God, this is so bad. Who are you racist to? Uh, okay. Firstly, <laughs> I don't believe that I was being racist. Okay. okay. For one thing. So it was somebody who had worked with for seven years who I considered to be a friend and they were Indian. They are Indian, British born Indian. And, uh, yeah, um, she had an, I felt like she had an issue with my YouTube channel. She really didn't like it. She was friends with another girl at work who was Punjabi. And, uh, she, this Punjabi girl accused me of cultural appropriation. And I get that sometimes I get some comments pe from people saying this is cultural appropriation, you know. What does that mean for, it, for people it, that don't understand? It's when you're um, taking aspects from a minority culture and okay. uh, I guess adopting it in your life somehow or taking advantage of those aspects of that culture. Isn't that a good thing? Well, it's, it's very debatable. If you Google like cultural appropriation, for example, like when you get like white pop stars and then they have employed some like Bollywood dancers and they have a Bollywood themed music video, but they have no connection to India and they don't really have okay. an interest in India. Okay. They just want to look cool. You know, they just, they're, they're appropriating it. That's okay. what it means. Understood. That's what it means. So, um, I've never seen my stuff as appropriation. I've always seen it as appreciation. But some people are very quick to judge and they think, okay, so she just is interested in India because she wants views. She wants, um, you know, India's a big population. Oh. She just wants to get attention. That's why she's doing it. It's wow. not because she actually loves it. It's because she wants attention. Or she's like posting something um, on Instagram about the culture and she doesn't actually know the deep meaning of it. She just thinks it looks cool. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I got accused of cultural appropriation from, not from this girl, but I always got this vibe from her. And then her friend at work accused me of cultural appropriation. This girl had like really issues with... Um, Whenever I spoke to her about the culture, so we became friends because I was interested in Indian culture and she is British born Indian. However, 
there were a few times that I would talk about Indian culture and she would just get really angry at me or she'd get really snappy at me. So she said, oh, she doesn't know Hindi, but I had explained to her what, you know, something was in Hindi and mm. then she'd get really offended. Like, oh, of course I know that I'm Indian, you know, yeah. like really snappy. And I'd be, oh, well, I'm so sorry. I thought you said you don't know Hindi or something. It's very difficult. I don't know if you feel like this, um, that Bangladeshi people are probably extremely different to British born Bangladeshi people. Do you not think? Yeah. So, and the same with, Indian people and British born Indian people. And there's this concept called British born confused Desi. I don't know if you've heard this yeah. where like people are a bit like confused and because they've grown up in a culture that's ma majority white. So they've always tried to fit in and yeah. but then their parents are Indian or Bangladeshi or yeah. Pakistani. And it's, it's very difficult and complex, I'm sure. Um, and I will never fully understand it. Anyway, she told me this is such, I'm sorry, it's, we're getting to the crux of it now. Mm. She told me that because she's Indian, she loves a bargain, okay? And uh, I was growing some tomatoes in my garden and I gave her some tomatoes from my garden and I said, oh, it's so weird. I don't understand why no one else wanted these. She said she wanted some, so I gave her a big bag and I said, um, I don't understand why no one else wanted these. Oh, but yeah, but because you're Indian, you love a bargain. But because she had told me this joke... <clears throat> I thought that I could say the same thing back. She looked at me like a face of thunder and instantly I knew I'd said completely the wrong thing. And I said, I'm so sorry. Like I just said, I'm really sorry. I really, I thought you told me that cause you're Indian, you love a bargain. Also for one thing, I don't think a bargain is a negative thing. I think it's a good thing. And it's fundamental to how India works. Like people yeah. don't, you go to a shop uh, even a fixed price shop, people will try and like, you know, bargain. bargain for stuff. And it's just fundamental to the way of life there. It's just, you know, I don't see it as offensive at all. Um, but she took offense to it and she's allowed to take offense to it. I have nothing wrong with So you with apologize that. straight I away. I apologize straight away. I said, I'm really sorry. Um, I sent her an email saying, I'm really sorry. Like I thought you said that because you're in junior love a bargain. I didn't mean to offend you. And she was being really cold with me for the rest of the day. And I felt really bad. And I just thought, oh my God, like, what have I done? Like, you know, this is someone as a friend, you know, I love Indian culture more than anything. The worst, the, the thing that I least want to do is offend somebody who's Indian. And, uh, I offered her a cup of tea and she just looked at, didn't look at me and, you know, looked really frosty a couple of hours later, she took me into a meeting room and she said, um, okay, you know, there's a few things you've said in the past, uh, but you really crossed the line this time. What you said is really racist. I'm allowed to say it, but you're not allowed to say it. Also, she took her witness into the meeting room and I was sitting down and this girl who's accusing me of racism, she's standing in front of me and I feel awful. Like I feel really bad. I feel like... I've offended someone that I'm friends with. I've offended someone who's Indian with a culture I love more than anything. And then also she's taken a witness and made it into a, like a very, um, she's made it something that I thought was quite small into a very big thing. You can't just uh, in a corporate environment, take someone into a meeting room and make a big song and dance about this kind of thing without it blowing up. Do you know what I mean? So I was really upset. Um, I felt awful. I went for a walk to a, for a walk and I was like crying. I felt really bad about it. And I bought her a gift uh, because I felt really, really awful. I bought her like a really nice plant and I bought her a card and I wrote in the card, like, I think you're an amazing person. I'm really sorry I upset you. I gave her this gift and she still seemed like really frosty and Did she whatever. Take the gift? She, she accepted the gift. Okay. She also accepted the tomatoes. <laughs> 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 but oh okay so I felt really bad about it so I actually told my manager what happened and uh when I told him I was crying I felt really bad I, this is the thing I'm one of those people that really hates upsetting anybody and when I upset somebody I feel like sometimes I get a lot more upset I just hate yeah. even if I don't like the person I don't like upsetting anybody I hate that feeling and I wish I was somebody that just didn't care, but I'm not. I really care too much. So I told my manager and I was crying. I told him everything. He said, it's fine. You apologized. You know, in that meeting room, I also apologized over and over and over. 
Um, he was like, there's nothing you can do about it now. I was like, okay, cool. But will you check that she's okay? So he did that. He checked she's okay. And then uh, he came out the meeting room with her and he didn't give me any reassurance, like that she was okay. So I was like, okay, this is a bit weird. Next day, go into work and I say to him, is she okay? He's like, yeah, she's fine, but I've reported you to HR. <laughs> Well, the, the manager yeah. reported you to the to yeah. HR. Yeah. Okay. He's like, well, I've reported you to HR. And he was like, I don't think it'll come to anything. I don't think it'll come to anything. But I had to report it. I was like, I was like, okay. Thinking, okay, fine. Uh, HR did a private investigation. They interviewed everyone involved. They interviewed me. I had to get my union involved. It was like, you, it feels like you've been arrested. It feels awful. And these corporate companies, they feel like they have to implement action because if they don't, it's like if something gets out to the press or it's their reputation gets ruined and all this kind of thing. But also I think they're just trying to make up for the fact that they just don't employ enough ethnic minorities in the first place. So they're using you as a, as a, as a prop to demonstrate where... Yeah, well, it's like an opportunity for them. That, oh, they, I think HR was super excited. They were like, yes, we get to do something and like, <laughs> you know, punish this person and implement what we stand for and everything like that. And it's just so ironic because you couldn't get a white person who's more interested in like the Indian culture or like other cultures and stuff. And I hate this whole thing of like, if, if you've offended somebody, that you're going to shine a torch on that person and be like what you've done is really bad and then punish them. Surely if someone makes a mistake or they offend somebody, the best thing to do is just to talk about it and learn from it rather than, you know, make it like, yeah. make, like punish that person. Do you think, was she competitive? I mean, were you, was she senior than you or were you guys doing the same role? She was, um, she was on a lower level than me. She recently got promoted to the same level as me basically. So do you think she blew it out of, I mean, disproportionately just to kind of get you out of the picture? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. Also, she didn't put the complaint in, right? It was my manager. Oh, so from her, she probably would have got over it, you know, over time. She, but so her interpretation of what I said, her statement was quite damning because her interpretation of what I said is not what I said. So I got to read all the statements because I appealed the decision. Mm -hmm. They gave me a disciplinary. The disciplinary means you're not allowed a pay rise or a promotion for one year. I'd already been asking for a pay rise and a promotion for seven years. So imagine being given this thing and it's like, oh, okay, right. So I appealed the decision. When you appeal, you get to see all the statements from everybody. The statement that I read from her, she said, um, okay, so Laura, yeah, my real name, she said, Laura said something along the lines of, isn't it funny the only Indian person wants something for free? I did not say that. I did not say that. That's her emotional interpretation of what I said. Every other statement from everyone else who was there matched what I'd said, which was, you know, because you're Indian, you love a bargain or whatever. That was, but apparently I shouldn't have even mentioned her, her race or anything, uh, according to HR. You can't mention people's race now in the office, wow. apparently. So this is the thing, it's becoming, like, it's good that this is happening, that they're really strong on racism, but I feel like it's going too far the other way. And then also you're penalizing the wrong people. You're damned if you're taking an interest in the culture and you're damned if you take no interest. So you're, you're almost safer just, um, you know, it's, it's almost like it's safer just to, to not take an interest at all than it is to take an interest in someone else's culture because you might, you're just going to offend people. Do you know what I mean? Mm, that's that's it's crazy. Really, it's, and that ultimately meant it was the end of your job that you really needed. I didn't get fired. <clears throat> but you resigned. But I resigned, yeah. Okay. I took sick leave for three months because it really affected my mental health in a bad way. Not as badly as like... Uh, sort of mental health bad stuff that I'd had before but it but it affected me as I wasn't able to sleep because I kept thinking about it over and over again and it really like it actually stopped making YouTube videos because I was like at the time because I just felt so bad about it like I just wow. felt like it really made me question like what I was doing and like you know 
I was like, is it right that I've taken an interest in this culture? Like, is this kind of thing going to happen more often? Am I going to be accused of racism, Am I accused of cultural appropriation just for taking an interest? And, you know, if you take an interest in a subject that you're not native to, of course, you're going to make mistakes. Of course, you're going to offend people. That's the nature of learning anything. If you learn anything, you're going to make mistakes. That's how you really learn. So you're down. So um, what year was it? Um Was it 2022 or when, well, when you, this when, happened? You, when you left, when you eventually left. I left, left last country. year. Last year. I Now, actually stuck it out for a bit um, <laughs> after I took sick leave. I stuck it out. I took a really long trip to India for one month because I was like, I'm going to rinse the annual leave <laughs> as <laughs> much as possible. So I went for a month. And then the week after I got back, I handed my notice in. And then on the last day, I won an award for the company for like most creative promo of the year for for kids tv or whatever so it was like my last day i won this like prestigious award it was super awkward because because like everyone <laughs> well everyone knew i was leaving but everyone knew about this like scandal as well and yet the one person that's won this award the only piece of work that was nominated or whatever is by this girl who's now leaving uh Yeah, it was it was mad. That But I got to I got to leave with my head held high. That was the main thing. That was that was quite cool. Well, now you're in a much better position. You work for yourself. You're your own boss. You've yeah. got your own studio. You travel to wherever you want, whenever you want. So that's well, amazing. Well, yeah, hopefully. Um, now, you said, you mentioned about Brick Lane and how you came across Muslim people and Bangladeshi people. Yeah. What is the difference between, um, obviously, you've experienced... Um, both sides by now indian you've you went deep into indian culture mm. and you've kind of experienced um the bangladeshi mm. culture as well from from brooklyn mm. what's the difference what what did you th- identify as a as a difference or or maybe there's no difference at all i don't really see that much difference To be honest, oh, but it's just different. It's just slightly. I don't, to, okay, there is a difference, obviously, um, but I've only scratched the. It's not fair to to ask that because I've only scratched the surface okay. of Bangladeshi and Pakistani culture. I don't really know it. So for me, it was just. <clears throat> I mean, Bangladesh is interesting because there's there's similarities. Obviously, Kolkata has like food that's similar to that Bangladesh. You've got a lot of like fish dishes. You've got mishti doi. That you have is, is it pronounced mishti doi? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you have that in Bangladesh, right? But you also have that in Kolkata and West Bengal, and yeah. So, um, yeah, I I don't know enough uh, to know that the thing that I find weird is the fact that when I'm in India, um, in terms of Islam and like Muslim culture, there is that women aren't allowed to go into any or any mosques really which i find really strange but in the uk women can go yeah. in any mosque yeah so obviously a different part of the mosque or whatever but it's not in in india i really wanted to go to some mosque in south india and there was loads of really really cool stuff written about it online and everything and i thought okay i really want to go there went there with um ready to wear hijab everything and then they're like oh only men can come in I was like, what? Mm. I found that really weird. Because I was like, okay, that's really strange. So, and then uh, talking to like one of my Muslim friends, he was like, well, it's very common in India that women pray at home. They don't pray in the mosque. Yeah, I think so, it's that cultural um, thing, you know, the comparison between Desi, Desi, well, confused Desi and, and the people from the, the origin, even in Bangladesh, they don't. They don't, oh really? They don't, yeah, no, they don't. I think it's more to do with culture, Res, less of the religion than than the than culture. Do you not think it's better that women can go to a mosque here than in Bangladesh where they can't? Yeah. Yeah, here they they do. I mean, a lot of the mosques they they accommodate female prayer facilities. Yeah. Um, I think people are people here in some sense are much. I mean, in in many sense broader in their understandings do you think it will change in bangladesh do you think eventually women will be allowed to i don't know i mean i think it's it's a huge change and it's probably going to take a long 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 time okay because in a way then the uk is actually quite an amazing place then it it really is i mean a lot of things you know so 
one thing that we find as as Muslims or, or Bangladeshis, um, if you want to meet someone very famous, you can meet them when they come to this country. You can meet them like mm. they can, you can even probably invite them to your house. But once they're gone to back to where they come from, like these people are hugely famous. So mm. we've had some reciters, Quran reciters, in our house. Mm. In Egypt, they're like they're your A-list celebrities mm. when it comes to recitation. But in this country, yeah, you get accessibility in 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 in, in a very very big way. Whilst I was living near Brick Lane, um, I got invited uh, by a food vlogger called the Huludi Foodie, who is a Muslim. Uh, he's he's British-born Gujarati. Muslim and he invited me so I was I don't know how we got in touch how we got talking on Instagram or something but I was living near Brick Lane at the time and he invited me to go to his mosque uh, which is the Azizia mosque in Stoke Newington I don't know if you've been there yeah yeah it's beautiful and he gave me a tour of, of that mosque and we were talking about Ramadan and everything and I was like oh you know I've always wanted to try fasting so I tried fasting and I fasted for two days uh, for the first time in my life. And um, and I also went to the mosque, to the Azizia mosque with his wife and prayed also with all the sisters there. So that was an amazing experience. I loved it. It was great. What, what feeling? What were you <coughs> feeling while you were in that mosque? Was there any difference or you were just... It felt like... Um, I feel like, we're, so I, my background is my grandparents are very devout Christian, Church of England, and uh, my mom's Christian, my dad's atheist, so I'm agnostic. But I, in in your experience with church, it feels like, um, I'm, okay, I wasn't a regular church goer, but with church, I feel like it's quite, um, feels much more isolating in the prayer and everything. But when I was praying at the Azizia Mosque, I felt like you feel very, even though I'm clearly, I'm not Muslim and I'm white and everything, I felt like we just felt like one unit, like we're all unified. Maybe we're all thinking different things or whatever, but it just felt so peaceful to be all doing doing it together. It was just nice. Like all the movements and everything. And what, what do you think of Islam? I mean, it hasn't had the best of press um, in the last 20 years or so. Mm. What's your opinion? I... Out of all the religions that I've come to learn about and explore, I think I identify with Islam the most because it's more similar to Christianity. But I, And I think a lot of pe Christians in this country don't realize that because they don't learn enough about the religion to realize that actually they're very similar. So, yeah, I identify with it more. Like if I, yeah, if I was to meet like a Muslim guy and he said, or like if I liked him and we got, and we wanted to get married, I would convert. I wouldn't have an issue with that. <laughs> so why don't you convert now? <laughs> because I don't want to, because I don't want to convert. I don't want to uh, commit to any religion really. Okay. I, I like to sit on the fence. <laughs> so I any, like, any I Muslim like... guys, any brown guys, <laughs> brown Mondays, um, if you are. <laughs> no, I mean like if it was like important to him you know mm -hmm. that i converted that like that i would convert but should it not be important to you i mean because maybe you're searching for something and this, this is what i asked you right at the beginning what you is trying your to convert purpose me now? No, no, i'm not trying to convert <laughs> you um i think you No, only, i like being agnostic i like i tell you why i like it because i feel like being agnostic people say oh you're sitting on the fence blah blah imagine the fence okay you're sitting on the fence there's a field over here it's full of people who follow religion there's like a mixture of people who seek muslim um hindu whatever then there's the other field and it's just people that are atheist if you sit on the fence you can see both sides to the argument and you can empathize with both communities and both people so i quite like sitting on the fence with it mm. i would always i grew up uh, believing in god and i would ask my parents questions and my my dad would always say oh, ask your mom because she <laughs> was the one who was christian and my dad was atheist so i would always ask her and she would answer like uh, give me the answers like a christian basically so mm. i 
yeah, I, I grew up believing in God. It wasn't until I was like um, a teenager or like later years in life, I was like, okay, I'm not sh like meeting other people who are atheists. And I was like, okay, I understand like your perspective on things. And I don't know, I just, um, I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> What's your position on Palestine and Gaza? And, and oh, for man. that matter, the Chi Muslims in China who are who are oppressed and Muslims okay, in India go, who are oppressed. There, before we go there, can mm. I just also say that my audience is mostly Hindu. Yeah. And um <laughs> I don't know I don't think that me doing this video is gonna benefit my channel at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. But it's important. It's, it's but important I, but, but I, to open the dialogue. It's important yeah, to yeah, understand yeah. each other. Because end of the day, what's the point of living in that bubble and you know having being in your own world? Because there's a, the world is vast. It's yeah, huge. Yeah, for sure. You know, me sitting here talking to you. Some may say, "Oh, why are you doing like you know talking? You know this and that nonsense, whatever." Mm. They could classify as that. But to me, it's not because mm. I'm learning something new. Yeah, you know, I'm understanding your perspective, and this is why I'm asking you. You know, what's your position? you know, with the, with the unfairness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it's not just Muslims, you know, there's so many different unfairnesses. Oh, for sure, for sure. But right now, mm. it's what's in the prime time is, 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 is the situation yeah. in Palestine. So I, so, okay, yeah, but can, why, can we talk about other stuff first? <laughs> I just, <laughs> I'm not an expert on what's going on there. So I don't feel like, I mean, obviously what Israel's doing is horrendous, like it needs to stop. And it should have stopped ages ago. It's horrible. Like I, I was. Yeah, it's just horrendous. Do you think you saying this is going to offend your? No, audiences? no, no, not at all. I don't think so. I'm just saying that even just me speaking to you is probably going to offend people. You went but to walking mosque as well, and you got you had a backlash. I had a huge backlash for Why? that because um, <clears throat> I was interviewing. Uh, so the, I was interested in it because it's the first purpose-built mosque in the UK. I don't know if you've been there. Have you been there? I haven't been there, but I've driven past it. You need to. You <coughs> drove past it, but mm. you didn't get out and look. It's like London Eye. You know, you drive past it all the time, but you haven't been into it. <laughs> Did you drive past it, like as in like the road, and actually see it from the car? Yeah. yeah oh, okay. Yeah. At least there's that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you. But um, it's beautiful. It's stunning, and um, I was just so fascinated by the history of it. When it was built, it was when India and Pakistan were one country. And now it's <clears throat> ran by, it's mostly Pakistani community there. And uh, the reason they got offended is because um, the mosque manager called uh, Kashmir, hit the part of Kashmir he's from is uh, Azar, Kashmir, free Kashmir. Yeah. And uh, it really offended a lot of Indian people. But I think it just offended people in general that I was speaking to Muslims just because it, I, it made me realize, wow, a huge amount of my audience were probably quite right wing Hindus. And I got like something like 800, 900 people unsubscribed. It was mad. <laughs> and then wow. after that, every video that I made didn't do as well because YouTube kind of sees what's happened and then they penalize you for yeah. it. Yep. So, so I lost a huge amount of my audience. It was very difficult to pick up the views again after that. In fact, I didn't I don't think I've produced, yeah, it was, it was nuts. I had a big momentum and I visited Hare Krishna temple. I visited a Gurudwara and then I was like, cool. Well, next thing I need to do is visit a mosque. It makes sense. Like, you know, there's Muslims in India and there's the history of this mosque and everything. Um, but yeah, uh, and I'm friends with Imam Hashmi now. I have his number. If I have a problem, I just speak to him. I went to go and see him a second time. And he's lovely. He's a really nice guy. And what we what was ironic is what we were talking about is the prejudice that Muslims have, and yet people aren't listening. They're just commenting really horrible, nasty things and saying, "Oh, she's a jihadi," and like, "Oh, like, oh my well, god!" Yeah, people were saying that in the comments just because I went to interview. Uh, the mosque manager and went to this mosque and went to in interview wow. the imam there. You know, in cells, yeah, we have this thing where you don't want to serve each and every single customer that comes through your door. I mean, you have to qualify them. And maybe with audience as well, sometimes you have to really 
think you know do they really appreciate my work and and is it just because their self interest they're following me or my work and maybe sometimes once you and maybe when you go to bangladesh and pakistan and other mm. countries you will probably see like okay lali is not our lali anymore she's uh, she's you know becoming everybody else's lali no but i was glad to lose that audience cuz i was like you exactly. know what i was happy to lose that audience i was like you know what if that's what sort of my some what some of my audience was like, I'm glad they've gone. I don't want to be like producing content for that audience. Absolutely. No way. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to do more videos about Islam and yeah, it's great. Lali, we're towards the end of it. There's so much to talk about. Oh my God, you know, I'm this, sorry. This is, this is like, um, this could go on and on. Um, you know, you, you'd imagine like, what's Lali doing here on, 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 on this guy's podcast that's known to be controversial? I mean, we even switched up our I'm seat. Really, I'm really worried about the stuff that I said about the stuff that happened at Nickelodeon. Um, I mean, you haven't mentioned any names and you've spoken about your own experience. Mentioned and, the company, though. I mean, <laughs> no one can uh, delete your history, right? You know, mm -hmm. if 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 some if I experience something in a certain place, then I have to give the location of that. Do you think place, it right? would affect my career, though? You are your own boss now. I know I'm my own boss, but I have clients. YouTube doesn't care, like you know, <laughs> who who you know what your. I mean, look, it's we should sympathize because if it seems as though it was unfair, mm -hmm. what what happened? Is that what you think I from think your so. perspective? I think so. If if I was the boss, do you think I'm racist? No, I don't think so. I mean, do you think have, it was racist? No. Okay. No, because I tried to, when you were saying, I was trying to think maybe it's like, you know, when a black person calls themselves certain N word, mm. but when someone else calls them that N word, it's offensive. But here it's nothing to do with color, race or anything. It's, it's just a, a comment that someone... Well, they said it was a racial stereotype. Yeah. And that it was a negative stereotype. Yeah. No, but I don't see it as a negative stereotype. I do see it as a stereotype. But it's, but it's kind of like stereotypes sort of come from truth a lot of the time. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Like, I guess it's okay to have stereotypes as long as you don't think that everyone falls in line with yeah. that stereotype, I guess. I'm sure but, our audience will comment and say, like, you know, if they found it racist <laughs> and if they th felt, you know, it was unfair... Um, I'm sure they'll, they'll, they'll understand I can the just context. see it being the trailer just like, I was accused of racism. No, 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 no absolutely <laughs> not. Um, but at least we have had to change this uh, seat up because of the past few episodes. Oh, yeah. Uh, on, on, on <laughs> you didn't want to share the seat. I didn't seat. want to share that seat with that guy. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, so you collect matchboxes. What's this fascination with matchboxes? Come on. Like, Do you get different matchboxes? matchboxes in bangladesh yeah oh my goodness can when you next go there can you collect some for me please okay talk, talk to me about okay. this fascination first before before we get to collections because, because i love okay so what i love and one thing that i really love about india is the um the individuality of the artwork that you get and when i say artwork i don't mean just artwork as in like a picture on a wall or whatever i mean like the artwork is in on the trains for instance for the women's carriages they have these like individual sort of drawings or paintings for showing where the women uh, go on the carriage and they every single one is not the same they all look different because a okay. different artist has done it okay so it's like I love that. I think it's beautiful. And I'm just like, we lost that element of um, individuality in the UK, I guess. And hand, like not hand drawn or whatever, but the matchbox thing is just an example of many, many, many different designs for one product, right? And And lots of beautiful, like, almost mini bits of art like i'm good i'm collecting them because i want to make a big picture and and put them all like on this picture and you know have this collage of all these matchboxes because it just looks so cool do you not think wow i mean do you not think uh, i find it fascinating that you're fascinated about I'm fascinated. matchboxes yeah but i'm a creative person so i'm very stimulated by drawings and images and colors and things like that so seeing something like that Okay, so how many designs do you think there are for matchboxes in the UK? It's probably like one yeah, or two. Yeah. There's two, there's probably like maybe five brands. And are they colourful? No. Do they have cool pictures on them? No. <laughs> well, so, but you know, you know, you know, in West, you have something called brand guide. And, you know, the, everything has to fit yeah, within a certain boring. framework. 
That's boring. That's probably why India is a chaos. I mean, the Indian subcontinent is a chaos because there is no brand guide for the country. That's what I love, though. <laughs> even if you get, even if you collect the same matchbox, right, with the same design on it, you will always notice differences between the two. That's wow. what I find mad. Wow. Like, do you know what I mean? That is that is um, that is fascinating. It's just the lack of factory stuff, I guess. I mean, it's probably made in a factory, but for some reason, the print is slightly different every time. Yeah. <laughs> what aspect of India? your experience with India, not Indians in the UK, um, has impacted your life? And have you, you know, did certain things in a different way after you've discovered India? There's a lot of Indian objects in my house, um, but it's a very British house in in some ways. It's a Victorian terrace house. It's very British looking. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of Indian stuff. I mean, I love the Indian clothes i don't know i really like the kind of modest um indian dress i just think it's it's ju- i just find it looks more beautiful i feel like the clothes fit me there and and suit me better than a lot of western clothes for some reason i don't know i just love the dress i love the designs and the dresses and everything it's very the fabrics. elaborate yeah the fabrics and stuff um Has it changed my life? I think it's just opened up my eyes to things more. I I notice things that other people perhaps don't. If you don't explore other cultures, then you're kind of just walking down the street like with your, you're not really paying attention to other things going on around you. Whereas I feel like I pick up on, I don't know, I just pick up on things like better from other cultures Mm -hmm. and stuff. And I think a lot of people that aren't interested in other people's cultures just walk down the street and don't, I don't know. They just don't notice things. I don't know where I'm going so, with this. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Sorry. You're, you're very, talk, you're very honest. I'm talking you're, rubbish. You're very. No, 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 no. It's, Sorry. You're very honest. Um, now talk to me. You've been to India a number of times. Um, maybe you don't want to ask, answer this question. I hope you do. Did you did you sense any differences in how Muslims and Indians interact with each other? Are there a, a, any form of racism? You know any form of hate or looking down on each other by each each groups i mean what was your experience did you i've not seen anything i've not seen anything like that i have seen videos of stuff that i find quite shocking like people you know muslims like praying in the street or something and then someone i don't know like policeman or somebody comes around and hits them on the head or something like that i i've never seen things like that um I have two Muslim friends, three actually, in India. And I've asked them, like, have you experienced um, problems uh, being a Muslim in India? And they've all said yes. I mean, one of them, they said, like, they're not, like, they've had landlords, like, turn them down literally because they're Muslim, which is ridiculous. Um, And he even, on my way here, he was even texting me saying, I'm looking to emigrate to a different country if Modi gets in, which he will again this year. He was like, I'm thinking to move, which is, I was like, that's such a shame because you shouldn't have to move. But a politician Mm -hmm. like Modi, I think is, I think he's done some good things, but I think in terms of like, he definitely favors obviously Hindu. So that's adding to the problem like massively. That is so crazy. I mean, India is a hugely Muslim, I mean, a huge Muslim population. I think in terms of the ranking, in terms of how many Muslims live in each country, I think India is probably on the one of the top two or three. Mm. Um, so huge population. And what's ironic is they've got like all the, um, is it pronounced Mughal or Mughal? Yeah, m- Mughal m- like yeah. culture that they have yeah. there. The, some of the most beautiful buildings like the Taj Mahal and the Red Fort and everything. And, uh, and yet, like, they, I don't know, it's just nuts. I, it's absolutely nuts. Like, even think, uh, yeah. Does it disturb just, you, all of this, you know, knowing all of this and how the way, how the world runs and how things are? The way are. the world is going at the moment, it's really worrying, like, massively. And even though I said, oh, you know, I'd love to get married and have children, it's just like, would I really want to bring up kids in this world? Like, it's just getting more increasingly difficult to live in it, I think. Um, yeah, so. But I guess you can only do your part and the children will hopefully grow up and, <laughs> you know, fight their way across yeah, um, in this in this world. Uh, do you ever see yourself marrying a Muslim man? Um, 
Why specifically Muslim? Okay, fine, Indian as well then. <laughs> I don't think he has to be Indian. I don't think he has to be Muslim. I don't think he has to be any particular religion. Um, he just needs to have a good heart. Mm. But put it this way, I don't think I'm going to end up with a white guy. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why that is. I just don't. So when you go on a dating site or something, is you apply the filter? No white guys or. I wish you it? could do that. I actually at one point specifically just just because you can change the religion. I did actually put just Muslim once, just <laughs> just just to get more brown guys. <laughs> um, but no, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I yeah. I I hate dating apps for one thing. I think they're really toxic. I think they're awful. I think it's really hard. It's really hard if you don't if you if you don't belong to a religion where your family help you find somebody. It's very difficult to find somebody. It's very hard. So you believe in arranged marriages? I don't believe in them. Uh, what do you mean by believe in them? Obviously, <laughs> like, they do you, exist. Do you, <laughs> do you do you accept that it's a good thing? arranged marriages I think it depends how you do it I think if it's like um can we introduce you to some people and you say yes I think that's fine I don't I think if it's like you must marry this person I think that's that's that's, that's, that's not good yeah. or like putting people under pressure uh coercing them into marrying yeah, someone I I god knows what kind of people my parents would come up with for me to marry that's really sh- strange thought what like, do you think what kind of names would be popping up imagine you you told um ask them can you get me some proposals I don't think they'd want to go down that road <laughs> <laughs> too much too I much work think, I don't think they'd want to go down that road it's too alien to them it would be really strange so I not um yeah, I've got friends that have gone into arranged marriages that work. I've got friends that have gone into arranged marriages that haven't worked. Um, the ones that haven't worked are the ones where the parents are saying, you have to marry this person. Like, you have to. Like, and, and, and the guy has been like, I don't want to. Like, actively said, I don't want to. The ones that have said, yes, I want to and agreed like that is it's worked fine but the one like it's just mad i can't believe actually that was really eye opening for me because even though i'd heard about arranged marriages and forced marriages i didn't think that it w- was actually real until i was actually able to witness that firsthand where i had a friend who was like saying i am begging my parents to not marry this person i don't love this person i never will love this person I don't want to be with this person. And then they've had to marry them. I mean, the difference between forced marriage and, uh, and arranged marriage is, is in its name, like arrange and force. Force is not allowed. Like no one should be forced into anything. I mean, mm. uh, it doesn't matter who you are. Um, arrange is like arranging travel arrangements, transportation. You know, you offer solutions, options. If you like it, you take it. If you don't like it, you don't take it. But the arranged marriages shouldn't turn into forced marriages at the end. Mm. But I think it's... it's Personally, I think it's a good idea, arranged marriages. But I think now more and more parents are finding it quite difficult, you know, to do this whole arrangement business and they just leave it to their children. And say, Why know, do they find it difficult? Because they can bring someone and then they will get rejected. The proposal will get rejected. I mean, it does exist. There are like within our community, Muslim community, there are WhatsApp groups where people talk about, you know, <clears throat> matching people up and they share CVs without photos. Um, but more and more parents, I think, they're, they're just leaving it to the children now to come up with their choice. And uh, Did you have an arranged marriage? Semi-arranged, I would semi-arranged. say. Semi-arranged. Semi-arranged. <laughs> it was a hybrid. A hybrid. <laughs> yes. See, I like the sound of a hybrid. I'll be on board with the hybrid. I think that sounds good. <laughs> See, the way I met my wife is a, is a very, very interesting story. It's, it's, it's a st- definitely a story for another, another day. But um, I met and then uh, handed over to the family to do the, you know, uh, rest of the arrangements. Okay. So the choice was on my part and her part as well, yes. Um, but uh, Lali... Sorry. It's, it's, it's been a very, very, I guess, I dynamic conversation. Dynamic. I mean, we've covered so much. I can't even remember how many things that we've spoken about. We've spoken about racism. <laughs> we've spoken about your fascination with, with matchboxes, going to India, you know, ending up in hospital... There's, there's a lot of angle to this story. Um, let's um, end, mm. inshallah, mm. with a quick fire. Quick fire what? round? 
quick fire round. Yeah. I hope you're ready for this. Oh my goodness. I didn't know this was part of it. Of course. Maybe I've is... just not watched the end of all your videos. And you can ask me a question as well at the end of um, quick fire and then we'll end, end it with that. Okay. What's your favorite Indian dish? Oh, that's so hard, man. There's so much. This is not going to be quick fire. This is too. Okay. I really like dahi pori. That's it's yeah dahi puri. dahi puri dahi puri is like you know pani puri or dal or, puri is it, is it like with the lentil lentils no 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 no, no. you know like pani puri oh yeah yeah the crispy thing the shell that's that the put. that's a sweet version isn't it pani puri oh no no it's not spicy okay spicy okay yeah. dahi Halwa puri is. dahi puri is a sweet version you're okay. right it's with yogurt and oh, you have that it in the and the, with the um crispy oh, I don't even know what you call it crispy noodly things nice. and the and the yogurt and then you can maybe have like pomegranate and tamarind sauce on it and okay. everything it's nice i haven't tried it I'm street try food it. it's good top tip for learning hindi top tip for learning hindi um mm, don't just learn the language learn the culture is what i would say you're not gonna learn the language if you don't learn the culture a hundred percent and You're they right. both go hand in hand. You're so right. So you you can't you can't learn a language without learning the culture. The the culture is so deep and so rich in India that you won't learn the language if you just look at it down the academic route. You have to follow social media to do with pop popular culture in India. You have to really re do your research and actually watch Bollywood movies and actually watch Netflix India everything Amazon Prime India. Just expose yourself as much as possible with as much of the culture because that's where you truly learn the language. Amazing. What's your, what is your must have item in your travel bag? Only one. I mean, you have so many other things, but what, what's one thing that you can't travel with that? In India, water. Anyway. Water? Yeah. Bottle of water. Bottle of water. Okay. You really don't want to be stuck without a bottle of water. <laughs> Favorite Indian actor? Uh, Amir Khan. Amir Khan. Yeah. Shah Rukh Khan. No Shah Rukh Khan, yeah? No Shah Rukh Khan. Amir Khan. Three Idiots. You must have seen Three Idiots. Have I? I don't know. Do you know oh, my it's, days. It's, it's, it's some of these, um, unfortunately, <laughs> Indian uh, films Amir are very Khan, long. Amir Khan's really good because he does a lot more stuff to do with uh, controversial issues and things in his in his films. It's brilliant. I love that film, The Lion. I don't know if you've watched Lion. It's based on a true story where this kid ends up in Australia and he has to find his way. Um, it's beautiful, from his but do you know what? There's a really cringe part of that movie that I really hate, which is the when the woman who adopts the kids, you know, when she's she's standing there, she's like, I just had this vision that I had these two brown children. It's really weird. <laughs> she does this really weird. It's that's the only part of the movie I really don't like. But yeah, it's an incredible incredible true story i mean it's just amazing man, that made me cry i mean it made me cry too it, it made is, me cry too man it's crazy um do you have any questions for me what's the most interesting thing that you learned about me today <laughs> what did i learn interesting um about you well, okay what's the most surprising Matchboxes. I mean, I knew about Are you. Are you kidding I mean, me? I mean, I, I just, I know I get it. We you covered know, being, the racism at work thing and you're going with matchboxes. I mean, that's interesting because it's like, I wanted to ask you, I knew that there was a fascination, but I didn't know the nuances of, of that fascination. Oh. I get it being fascinated about aviation and cars and footballs and this and that. But So that doesn't boxes. interest me at all. No. But I did enjoy your documentary, even though I have no interest in airplanes. Thank you so much. You were really funny, <laughs> honestly. It was just it just made me laugh so much. Although you said I was short. <laughs> I'm, I'm when still I first thinking. met you, yeah, like just now. Oh, you looked taller in the video in the in the documentary. Maybe oh. I just think that everyone's taller than me, and and then when I meet people in real life, I'm yeah. like, oh, damn, I'm actually yeah, really. I'm still like I'm thinking. You know, I'm short. Sure, I'm sure. So, I'm sorry. That was probably like the worst <laughs> no, thing I'm to joking. say. I'm joking. Oh, um, you're shorter in real life. <laughs> um, look, uh, Lali, it's been a very interesting conversation. I hope our viewers will enjoy um, your story and um, it will spark their interest as well to explore. Yeah. Am I the you first non-Muslim you've interviewed? I've interviewed a couple of other people. One was um, a founder of a company. Um, he was non-Muslim. I think you're the second person. I'm only the 
second person. And you had a lack of women, I think, as well. Uh, so uh, you I know was... what? We reach out to women. They don't want to come. Why? I don't know why. You ask them. Why did, why you didn't we... even reach out to me. I reached out to you. Was thank like, you. Thank you for... I didn't know you existed, <laughs> but thank you for reaching out. And here we are. We're having... You expressed the interest to, to, to discuss, talk, and we're here talking. No, it's been fun. Um, but... Some women, they don't want to come and I hope they would come forward and, you know, they attack us, you know, for talking about certain subjects uh, when, when guys get together. Of course, um, if there's no other representation, then, yeah, that's the only thing that we, I mean, that's one of the aspects that is very yeah. interesting um, that men talk about. And it's not just in Muslim community, you know, and when two men get together, you know, there's always conversations and yes, um, around marriage is, is probably one of them. Yeah. Um, do you know what though like if i didn't do this youtube channel if i didn't find a fascination with india we would not be sitting here today absolutely not. which is just you know like the fascination of india going on to the fascination with brick lane living in east london getting to know the guys who run taj stores and then i followed like you know uh jamal and um the other guys junal what are their names junal the three J brothers jamal and yeah. uh Oh, what's his and name? his son Omar as well. And his son Omar. So that was the reason that I saw yeah. uh, Joinal, sorry. Joinal, Jamal, and Junal. Yes. Ju Is that right? I yeah. Don't know. I know Jamal. That's my friend, um, Omar's dad. Yeah. Um, very but yeah, nice the man. reason I saw you is because of the interview with Omar. Yeah. Uh, is it Omar or Omar? Omar. 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 Yeah. Omar. So look, I think many people, um, they draw that barrier themselves. Um, like, for example, if they see an English person, they'll be, they'll automatically think, oh, that person probably doesn't like me as a default or that pro person is probably racist to me. But if you haven't spoken to them, you wouldn't know what their mm. reaction is like. No one would if you didn't open your mouth and if no one knew what you do for a living, they will probably like, you know, not make an talk assumption. To you. Yeah, they yeah. would make an assumption and say, yeah, yeah, you know, another white person, isn't it? But, but as, do you think as soon that's as you why... talk? It's yeah. like, yo, this person is more Indian than 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 a white person. But do you think that's why you know some people don't give each other a chance? That's why communities stay closed and they one, don't get integrated. One million percent. Yeah. People just need to talk, and people just need to stop assuming things and ask. And this is why I'm not justifying, but this is why we get some of the guests to ask them questions like, you know, why do you believe certain things? And mm. Sometimes there's good sides to people as well. It's not just all bad and all wrong. I may have certain beliefs that you may not agree with, but that doesn't mean I have to project my belief and uh, you know project my opinion on you. Mm. You might have some beliefs that I may not agree with, and it's okay. Mm. As long as different. I don't project it, we don't project it on each other. We can co-live and you know have a dialogue. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, thank you so much for having me in. Thank you. Thank you for coming it's in. Really fun. And and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day with uh, Momlet. I'm so going <laughs> Shout to Shout out to Momlet, guys. My yeah. land. Um, yeah. And um, uh, Ramadan Mubarak to you. And Eid Mubarak to you. Yeah. It's just around the corner. How many days now? Um, today is the 28th. Tomorrow is the 29th. And it's most likely Monday. Or No, it can't be Monday. It, Tuesday or Wednesday. Nice. What, you, what are you doing for Eid? Um, family really and eat and be lethargic halfway down the through the day and just go sleep nice who does the cooking um, every family gets together They everyone cooks so you go to each other's houses oh, I'm so jealous yeah. that sounds fun yeah I invite you to Islam thanks explore it <laughs> did anyone give you a copy of Quran no I'm gonna gift you one. Oh, thanks I'd love that. Thank you. And um, I hope we'll stay in touch and um, we'll have creative discussions offline. Yay, that'd be awesome. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I hope you have enjoyed today's episode. If you have, please share it with your family and friends. Comment below with any questions you may have and any guest recommendations. And hit that subscribe button. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.